That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Very well learned here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to MOTN Reads. This is Masters of the Nerdiverse Reads, where we take a deep dive into some of your favorite comic books, graphic novels, and overall short stories that happen to tickle our collective fancy. I'm, of course, your host, Mike G, and with me for this episode of MLT and Reads is a none other than my also host, uh, my ba- the, I wouldn't say Batman to Robin, it's more like Billy Lee to Jimmy Lee, Winter Trash Monk the Thizzer. Lee! You understand the words coming out of my mouth? That Lee? No, I was thinking of Lee, 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 Lee. Yeah, Definitely. I'm doing good. I'm trash monk. <laughs> trash monk. I I I. Trash monk. I I I. Yeah. I'm coming at you in a mid uh, deep sleep or uh, playing a t- uh, slay the spire, which is a roguelike card game, and I decided to take some time off of that to record this episode, folks. Same here, and I'm coming off one of the most physically and emotionally, I would say, jarring weeks of my life. So. Uh-huh. Um, it's the Perkadan. It's the Perk. It's the Percocet. Percocet. Molly Percocet. Um, so reading this book actually helped me balance back out and uh, put things in perspective because this book is all about particular perspectives. And if you've read the title of this episode, you know we're doing the Mark Wade Alex Ross classic, Kingdom Come. Uh, man, I've been wanting to. Yeah, it's a delightful black comedy with Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, Cedric the Entertainer, <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be recasting them all as Scarlett Johansson. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and Julia Roberts. <laughs> and Julia Roberts, yeah. Oh, man. Welfare. <laughs> Welfare. So, yeah, speaking of the welfare of the world, this book's all about that, isn't it? Yeah. It's all gloom and doom, and things do go boom, you know, in this crazy kind of future telling of the DC universe, kind of as a whole, all told from the perspective of one man and kind of his crisis of conscience and his influence on on the future of where this particular um, else world of the DC universe could go. Um, this book, man, I remember the first time I came across this book was years ago. I we used to have a comic book club at the local comic book store. We, every week we would mm-hmm. go and the owner of the comic book store would just pick out a graphic novel and just have the group read it and we would talk about it. And this was one of those books where I just completely not on my radar as a young man and read it. And I was like, this is probably the best DC story I ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> You know? Yeah, I mean, head to toe, you mean like like uh, beginning, middle, and end DC story. It's really up there for me. You know, uh, what's your experience with this book, Winner? So I've never heard of this until I started doing Masters of the Nerdiverse, and I'm trying to read more comic books. And I thought it was going to be like a graphic novel length, yeah. uh, but we'll get into that later. But I started reading it, and it's there. Uh, I'm definitely coming in as someone who is like a newborn babe into the kingdom come. Yeah. Like they're the, they're the research you can go online that will like pinpoint every reference, every character reference in the yeah. background. And I think that's an important part that I kind of missed. Actually, I think it's in the background of this copy that I have as well. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. I have a copy that's like the, that talks about the artwork, um, and stuff like that gives a little bit of a script at the end. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I have both uh, a copy where it kind of goes into the backdrop of each in- individual character because there are literally hundreds of superheroes in this book. Yeah. And I also bought this giant tome called Mythology, where it just pretty much breaks down Ale- Alex Ross's relationship and history with the DC universe. And it's just all Kingdom Come. He's done short stories. For Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and just his love letter to DC, 
and these two tomes coupled together is just just pure just perfect my envisioning of what the dc universe should be it's just these two things put these two things put together yeah you know absolutely uh it's kind of i'm kind of curious to see where we should start in just the ex- the backdrop explanation well i think you should do a quick plot run through in the first in the beginning and then we'll go from there okay so pretty much we open the story um in kind of a sense of a premonition yeah of a kind of a, a premonition of what's to come and we have our central character who is wesley dodds who plays a pastor uh, who's kind of living in this new normal where uh, he visits one of his kind of people. He comes to visit one of his elderlies. I forget his actual name. Um, Norman McKay. No, no. Norman McKay is our, our, is our main character. I'm sorry. Right. This is the Sandman and the one that he goes. Yeah. And that's what I like about Wesley Dodd is that he's one of the golden age Sandman because it's multiple Sandman because it's DC. Uh So, um, Wesley Dodd kind of sets this in motion and gives um, uh, Norman a glimpse of the future of kind of, you know, the end times are coming. And we kind of see this jaded pastor or preacher or what have you walking through the world of this new normal and kind of um, what's happened after the men and women of tomorrow have kind of hung up their capes and let the new generation come into play. And just set the world on fire, <laughs> pretty <laughs> much, is what's going on. So, just to break down Norman's character, what how, what are your thoughts on Norman? Well, I, I think we really should wait before... You just need to run through the whole plot right now. <laughs> you just want me to go head to toe? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I said, uh, Norman is a pastor preacher who, who visits... Uh, Wesley Dodd, who gives them a glimpse of the of the titular future to where the heroes of the Golden Age, the Justice League, pretty much Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, they've all aged out. You know, mm-hmm. they've kind of all either retired or just kind of tucked back away to their own respective corners of the universe. And we've been introduced to this new age of heroes who have completely lost control. And they're just fighting for the sake of fighting and kind of keeping the world in a, in a, in a sense of turmoil for their own entertainment. Now, this is slowly bringing on the onset of the end of the world, to which Norman is then visited by the spirit of vengeance himself, the right hand of God, the specter, who kind of walks him through and carries him through as kind of a pseudo ghost of Christmas future kind mm-hmm. of character and kind of uh, shows him the different players that are going to ultimately decide the end of the world. And uh, do you want me to do full spoilers too? <laughs> like, like in, just, his, so in the synopsis? You know? You're just giving a rundown of someone goes like, what is Kingdom Come is all, is all about? Yeah, Kingdom Come is pretty much about um, Norman's, I would say, trip through the yeah. end of the world and kind of uh, him seeing all these different sides of things being played out from all different corners of the DC world, be it Batman's corner, Superman's corner, the villain's quarter, and that because of certain events that are going to be that are going to happen, it, the things are going to go one way or another, and Norman kind of has a direct influence on that, um, and kind of where the outcome of that falls, and. Uh, where things go from there? Will the world be healed and set back in place? Or is this truly the end of times? Is this truly the end of things that we do to ourselves? And Norman and Spectre kind of act as um, conscient- kind of conscientious observers to this entire event. Not to go into the absolute end of the story. Right. But needless to say, it's really about Wesley. Um, it's really about Norman's journey throughout these events that are going on as time passes and decisions are made and factions are, are created because um, there's going to be an event that's going to actually cause just everything to end and all things to die is kind of where we're going with this and kind of the outcome of that. If I'm explaining, maybe I'm explaining that a little too Mike macro 
but I'm just curious to see how you would kind of run this story down and what would be your synopsis of this story? No, that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, it's hard to kind of uh, it is. It, it's hard to put it in a micro thing because the whole story isn't micro. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. There's no time for little micro things here. Well, they they do spend. I I do have to say they do spend some time with Wonder Woman and Superman's relationship mm-hmm. and all that. But the majority of the com the majority of the comic book is macro. You yeah. have so many things, big picture things going on mm-hmm. that it, it, I. We sympathize. I sympathize with you there. Yeah, I was but, like, uh, it's hard to just have a. a I can, the synopsis is either feast or famine. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. I tell you everything or I tell you nothing. It's hard mm-hmm. to just kind of do be, beginning, middle, and end with this in a weird way because it's just so big, you know? Right. But like now that we have that laid in, we don't have to keep going back like inch by inch into the plot. We can now just talk about bounce around. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So where would you like to start? Where would you like? Where well, what you was think the we're... first question that you had? It was about. It was uh, about your your thoughts on Norman. Yeah, our, well, our kind of our main character. Yeah, so Norman is a very it's very interesting that he uh, is a pastor. There's a there's something being the message being conveyed is like uh, pastors. Well, according to me, or like the way I was reading it pastors like give good news they save people and all that but what how does he continue on in his uh, profession as a pastor in a world where the good guys is kind of gray where in the midst of them trying to help people they're actually hurting people Mm -hmm. and he needs to make sense of it it kind of reminds me of like the way pastors or how the way religious leaders interact in the with people or like preach or like give messages after there's been like worldwide tragic events yeah like there's been uh movements that have been that have been like set up after like genocides have taken place and pastors are are, people are struggling with the question why did this happen correct so i think there's, there's there's like a connection there of the character of going, okay, we have these superheroes that we're supposed to help, but now they're second generation that doesn't have the foundation of the first one, mm. which I think is important is, is an important thing to point out. Yeah. Storyline. Um, they're wrecking havoc. So why would this happen? And you see, like in the beginning, that he struggles with his faith. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then he's literally in count he's in literally confronted by this by the force of God. You know what I mean? Like, like no, put now your doubts are put aside. Now, guess what? I am these, I am, right. the, I am an instrument of God's will, and you are required right now. <laughs> so it's kind of this this man of faith whose faith has been kind of teetering based upon your 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 summary there. Just kind of mm-hmm. how do you explain things that happen to good bad things happen to good people, and yet maintain your strength and faith in a higher power, but then the specter just kind of appears and says, yeah, all of this is real. <laughs> your faith is not misplaced, but I really need your help with something. Right. And this is like always in the background of Superman comics, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like this is how Zack Snyder makes his bread and butter when he makes, <laughs> when he made Superman movies <laughs> of like this backdrop of, of, uh, of uh, Superman being, a, de- a a deity of sorts yeah and, yeah and i think uh it's kind of connected here of going yeah uh, what happens when this figure decides to retire <laughs> yeah what happens when god goes to sleep yeah you know and yeah. it's it's one of those things where and my biggest gripe with that is that it's a misplaced worship that Superman into himself is a false god because he never brings that upon himself. But the whole point of Superman, he is he never sees himself that way. <laughs> you know, right. he yeah. always sees himself as just a Kansas City guy just trying to do best as as he can, and the but, world puts that on him. Right? Can't you, know? you say that he kind of looks that way in this? And but in in Kingdom Come, like, yeah. What's the pre- pre- yeah? Because it's 
Absolutely. Like the, the reason why he comes back is going, well, I have a duty to do this. The reason, I, just to, and let's talk about Superman. And this yeah. is a good segue yeah. to talk about Superman, um, who's outside of Nor- of Norman is the kind of the secondary. He's the actual real, the, the physical world hero of the story. Uh-huh. And the main reason he leaves is because, I guess, 10 years earlier, uh, there was some kind of controversy with the small upgrowth of the new generation of heroes right. who, like you, you were mentioning earlier, have no control, who, who aren't built on the mm-hmm. truth, justice, and American way of the of their forefathers. And Superman is kind of is trying to fight that battle, just saying these guys are out of control, and your guys are are cheering them. You're, you're enabling this new future that you're not prepared for. In the same time, um, the Joker is actually on trial for killing Lois Lane, <laughs> which right. is insane. Between that, between the the world slowly shunning the old school and his love of his life dying, Superman exiled himself um, and just said, you know what, you, you, Earth, you can have it. I'm done. I'm just, I'm mentally done. And he just kind of, the man in Superman just couldn't handle it anymore. Right, yeah. and that has the ripple effect of all the other heroes going, well, if Superman's not going to do it. I guess I'm done too. Yeah. Yeah, Wonder Woman goes back to the mascara. Aquaman retreats to... Um, Atlantis, Batman just focuses on Gotham. The Justice League pretty much disbands. You know, right. certain heroes are still doing their thing in their respective areas, but everything's broken up, and just it lays ground for this new generation of heroes to just do whatever the hell they want, and which is causing most of these problems. Yeah. Also, I, I don't want to not forget to mention the Kansas incident with Parasite. Oh, right, right. This is another big thing. Which is um, Parasite accidentally cracks open Captain Adam, which is just, it always happens in comics. Captain Adam just doesn't need to be a superhero because if he gets damaged in any way, he's pretty much just a walking nuke. <laughs> and he just nukes wherever he if he if you cut him open, it's just a nuke, and it just it just white phosphor cleans everything he's next to. So those three things kind of all happening concurrently was kind of the birth of this new crazy normal. Uh, which I believe Mark Wade really wanted this to be kind of a metaphor for where comic books were going when this book came out. Uh, because during this time was the time that it was the birth of Image Comics. Oh. Uh, when um, all the major comic book influencers at the time, may it be uh, Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, um, Mark Silvestri, said, Marvel's not letting us do what we want to do. Like, we want to do crazy stuff. So they all left, and they all created Image Comics with Spawn and Savage Dragon and, and Young Bloods and all these super edgy, sharp, right. gunny you know heroes and villains. And the old heads were just like, "What is this, man? Like, this is not these aren't heroes, you know." But the world was eating it up, you know. Like people loved it. So I think this book is kind of a commentary to that '90s movement of stripping the wholesomeness out of your hero and just we all want dark edgy heroes so that's where you get characters like magog um right <laughs> you know who is just this gaudy golden god of a superhero he's just and he's just he's the poster boy of this new normal of all the patches and he just looks like a he just looks like a hot mess and that's the whole point you know what i mean yeah but the 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 also point like the best example that I can give is like uh, older folks that were living in the Great Depression era where mm-hmm. they, uh, till the day they die, like store everything. There's junk piles everywhere. And then you have their children, which never grew up not having anything because there's junk piles and food for days everywhere. So they don't understand the necessity of saving because there's always an abundance of stuff lying around. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like um, a different, like a generation, like again, the foundation's not there. So there's, so uh, there's a yeah. lot less carelessness or a lot like less carelessness. There's yeah. not, a, there's not any worth. There's not any pride or worth into uh-huh. what was laid out for them. Yeah. So they just, they just, and in a lot of these heroes in this book are the sons and daughters of, other heroes <laughs> right well you that's know. how it works in like in reality or like in the real world like yeah parents and then 
like then children uh what what is it like magog it could be like the the x files of the of the dc universe where x files can only be created in a world where everyone like people understand what skepticism of the government is the government's lying to you all that other stuff which are like young people type mentality. Yeah, you know, uncovering the truth. Yeah. Or in this or case, or like just breaking it down, because there there's an important section. Like Batman is still doing Batman things. Yeah, and that's <laughs> one saying, of the yeah. that's one of the cool things is because Wonder Woman goes to confront Superman. Like you got to get out this law, man. Right. These kid, these kids are going to destroy the Earth, and we need to show them the way. Superman's like, I tried showing them the way, man. They were trying to hear me. Right. And it, that's when they go to the montage of, like you said, Batman still doing Batman things, you know, mm-hmm. running his bat droids. The Flash is still doing Flash things. There's there's people out there still trying to make a difference, but we're all, but you are the center of that. You're the nucleus of what makes the Justice League work. Without you, it doesn't work. So she, you know, we get to the story where Superman makes his triumphant return. He cuts off his facial yeah. fuzz, and I do. It, I do want to say that. Um, I find it interesting that that's how how Batman survives, because um, it feels like he becomes the thing that he would totally not be for mm-hmm. in the world, like yeah. uh, one person control, like having his own everything. police force around. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's just part of his own frailty, right? Because in this book, Bruce Wayne is a beaten, broken man; like he yes. can barely walk around without some nutty exoskeleton that allows him right. to function because he's, he was, he's just been a man this whole time. Exactly. I think that's a very clever way of just pointing that out. Yeah. It's just like, he needs these robots. These bat drones are his arms, legs and will now because he can't do it himself anymore. Yeah. And it's also, it, I think that you can even parallel with Superman because Superman, I mean, uh, they they both, had the mantle of uh, like leading people and what yep. and, and Superman just leaves Batman, although he has his own group uh, that we find out later on, he, he mainly looks like he just focuses on robots. <laughs> That's he focuses on robots in Gotham, dude. He's not yeah. worried about anything else. Yeah. He kind of goes on to keep doing what he does. And this is before G- Batman beyond, you know what I mean? This is before that idea. Would it have been cool to have Batman Beyond in this story in lieu of that? Yeah, it would have been neat, but this is before that time. So, you know, Superman kind of reappears on the on the, on the the global scale right. and kind of starts to kind of discipline these heroes, you know what I mean? And the world just starts to just totally upend because it's just all out war all over the, all over the world with these metahumans. You know, these ticking time bombs and these heroes have been just without, with a devil may care attitude, just ripping the world apart. And the Justice League kind of show back up and say, hey, sorry, right? <laughs> we kind of took a little break, but we plan to um, just kind of set things back straight. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Locking up both villains and hero, quote unquote heroes. Heroes. Yeah. Um, and they create a new. Uh, Batman, Super Max prison, yeah. a Supermax Ultra prison, where Superman actually goes to talk to Bruce, and and of course Batman, Batman is if anything stubborn, uh-huh. and at first he's not trying to hear him, you know what I mean. So um, we get you know there's time passes where this is where I kind of alluded to factions start being made, right. you know what I mean, and S- Superman's kind of growing his contingency. Batman already, like you said, already has an established team, and then we start getting into the villains, <laughs> which is right. one of the more interesting parts of this story, because we still have Lex Luthor, we still have Catwoman, and all this stuff, but they have a trump card in their pocket, which is one of the more interesting parts of the story. One of the more interesting kind of characters is Captain Marvel. Yes. What was your feeling about this? I mean, not being like a big DC head, did that uh, did that appearance jar you at all, or were you just like, oh, okay? That's... I didn't quite know what was happening until the comic book itself told me. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I had to look up Captain Marvel and all that. 
how perhaps he's the only real or like one of the one of the real threats to Superman, would you say? Yeah, he's and that's what kind of jarred me is because he's one of the only heroes in DC Comics who can just fight Superman. Right. Like no tricks, no kryptonite, no red sun, just fight him on his level and beat him. And he's he's just walking around and they kind of alluded to like he's like this to all the other villains. He's this great white shark that's just walking through the water and everybody's just on edge when he's around. Cause right. Because he, he himself is a Superman that's under complete control of this evil cabal of villains. Right. And I was like, yikes. <laughs> I, can, I see why they're not worried about nothing. Now, since we're at this scene, could you explain the purpose of having the Riddler at the meeting? Yeah, the, it looks like there was just con- contingency, or there was just a group of the brightest minds, uh-huh. and that are living in uh, the the brightest villainous minds in the DCU. So you had Rachel Gould's son, you had um, the Dark Archer, you had um, Lex Luthor, Catwoman, um, the Riddler. Um, is actually noted as being one of the smartest people in DC universe. Okay, um, in regards to his. His function. I mean, he's not Metatron or anything like. He's not cosmically smart, but he's gotten over on Batman multiple times, and that kind of was their reasoning for having him at the table. It's just because he's really good at kind of deciphering clues and creating clues and things like that. So that's where he got his seat at the table for. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the same reason why Catwoman's there because she just she's very conniving and knows how to get in and out of situations. And these are the veterans at this point. Of the of DC villainy, so I think that's why they had a seat at the table when they were all just like when they were all just kind of coming up with a plan over the reemergence of the Justice League and kind of right. you know, what are we going to do now and how, what, do we have anything in, do we have anything planned for this and you know just and that's when um, Norman and Spectre kind of just snuck in on them and started watching and was like oh, okay <laughs> you know what's going on on this side of the wall right you know what I mean so. And this leads up to one of my favorite scenes in in this book. One of my favorite scenes is where Superman goes to the the superhero dive bar, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's, just, it's pretty much it's literally Moss Eisley. It's just a, a den of scum and villainy. <laughs> yeah, what music did you have in your head? <laughs> I, I was listening to um, I, when I saw this scene, I was I was thinking like Marilyn Manson, like same, <laughs> you know, I was like, sweet dreams are made of this or yeah. something or. I you go know. right to the Matrix uh, Rob Zombie Dragula. <laughs> yeah, I was right there with you, like really crummy. Yeah. Like like two thousand blade. blade. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking like yeah. some really crummy two thousands like butt rock dude or you know, like slimy like synth rock, you know? Definitely some some um do, some twicky. Do has. <laughs> do. Do hospice, you know? Yeah. So Superman just comes through and he just demands so much respect and attention. <laughs> like he just comes through and everybody just stops what they're doing. And it's like, uh, you know, you could just leave Superman. We're kind of just doing our own thing in here. Right. Superman is like, I'm, I'm, I'm just so tired of all of you. <laughs> and he just comes there and just and pretty much puts his foot down. It's like, bars closed. Yeah, pretty much. And he's just like, I've had, he's like, look, y'all need to get it together. Because <laughs> I will, I will throw all of you in the gulag <laughs> or whatever that thing is. I do not care. We don't have space. We don't have space for you in this future if you, if you decide to keep acting this way. And there's some heroes that talk shit to him, but they, no one's going to do anything, you know, it's Superman, dude. You know what I mean? So he kind of right. just does that. And then there, there's the scene. Well, this is where we, You'll find out later on in the comic, I believe. Uh, trying to get to it, there's mm. a ske- the skeleton dude. Oh yeah, dead man, dude. He's dead he's man. A- yeah, he's the only one that notices Norman or yeah uh, there. Dead man is cool, dude. He's uh-huh. he's one of those characters that uh, his name is Boston Brand or something like that. Yeah. Uh, he was a uh, he was a circus performer in like the early twenties, and he died. But the thing about his thing was is that he re- retained his consciousness as death, and he's yeah. more he's more or less a ghost, but he kind of he still walks the line between living and dead because he can his power is to p- possess other living things. You know what I mean? He just kind of he's just pretty much a ghost, 
but yeah, he can see the veil between life and death. So he kind of lives in the same place that the specter does. Okay. Yeah. You see in the panel, like everyone else is looking around, but this dead man is looking directly at the preacher inspector. Yep. So that's really cool. That's a really good touch. Cause if anybody could see him yeah. that way, it is, um, it's dead man. Cause he just has that power, but, and it makes sense later on in the comics. Absolutely. And yeah. then we have Superman's confrontation with Magog. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where Magog is kind of feel, still feeling bad about the whole parasite thing. And Superman goes to confront him about that whole situation. And Magog tries to fight Superman, but it's just like Magog never had a chance <laughs> you know, against Superman. Right. You know, he never had a chance. So. The cool thing about the, the the gulag is that Superman goes to Apocalypse, uh, which is yes. which is the it, home for Dark added, Side. Yeah, these are added scenes, right? Yes, these they are the were added in the scenes. Okay. They weren't in the original, so it gives you some backstory on the gulag. Yeah. So the gulag was created using apocalyptic technology, which is like a billion years ahead of Earth technology, um, created by Big Barda as the warden and Mister Miracle as kind of the creator. And Mr. Miracle is the greatest escape artist in the universe. Like he, he, you can't hold him down for anything. So they retro act, they retrofitted his power to escape to create something that's non escapable. <laughs> right. Yeah. So they used him and big Barda to create this gulag where they were going to place all these, uh, bad influence heroes and villains. You know what I mean? So, and that's kind of where, things start becoming really problematic because they start just piling in these people and then trying to kind of like, like socially and psychologically readjust them to be right. heroes, like trying which to is kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Like first forcing them into this place and then trying to give them resources. Yeah. Try to give yeah. them resources to become more well-rounded, you know, like, yeah. Okay, this is the right thing to do. You shouldn't just shoot your friend because you're mad at them. The your what? Po- your mm-hmm. powers have a responsibility. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and they're like, this is driving me crazy. I want a cigarette. Can yeah. I get a cigarette? They're like, no. <laughs> you have to listen to Superman talk to you all day, <laughs> which would drive anybody crazy. And there's a point that's made in the comic like, yeah, this is going to come to a head eventually. You know, all these powerful people are just going to have it with what we're trying to do here. Like, well, that's not today. <laughs> so let's not worry about it. One key scene I do want to talk about is the scene you're talking about with Dead Man um, and kind of the, the gathering of the gods of the DC universe. Right. Which is Ganthan of the Green Lanterns, the Wizard Shazam, uh, the High Father of New Genesis, you know, just these... And they're just kind of deciding the fate of the un- of the world, you know? They're just kind of like, eh, it's their problem. The earthlings, are gonna, <laughs> earthlings are gonna earthling. Let them figure it out. Let them figure it out. And this is a kind and, and Norma's not in this conversation because he can't just stand amongst these guys. So it's all, it's the specter is in this conversation. Right. But, does, but doesn't he, Norman, get pulled in there somehow? Yeah. Norman just starts to talk to these dudes, you know? Like, yeah. And they just ignore him. Like, what? Get out of here. Who is this? Who brought him? You right. know? And Dead Man's like, yeah, man, you don't want to talk to them, man. They're not trying to hear you, dude. And Dead Man's just kind of all nonchalant about it. He's like, yeah, everybody dies, man. <laughs> Look at me, I'm a skeleton, dude. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, since it doesn't affect him, then it doesn't. He doesn't worry about it. Yeah, he's like, when you die, look me up. <laughs> you yeah. know, he's, he's no big deal, <laughs> you know. And like you were mentioning earlier, when we were going into like Superman and Wonder Woman's relationship, and I always thought that was weird to put Superman and Wonder Woman together as a couple, though it's happened a few times in the comics, uh, their relationship is kind of not only splintered, but at the same time brought closer due to the events of this story. Yeah. You know, where at some point they're at odds because they just have, they have differing views of how things should go. And they're both very, they're both leaders, they're both alpha. So they're both very stubborn when it comes to defaulting to someone else's ideals, especially if they're passionate about it, especially Wonder Woman, she's not going to have it, she, you know? So there is a part of the story where 
they kind of, I would say, split split hairs, as it were. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it kind of call, and that also causes towards the end of the world and all these des- deciding factors that kind of go toward the climax of the of this book. And I just want to mention um, just one real quick. One of my favorite um, scenes of the story is where they're meeting in Green Lantern's ultra satellite. <laughs> it's just ultra that's floating over the earth and and McKay and, and, um, and the specter kind of listening, listening in on the justice leagues uh, meeting where Superman's just kind of like, all right, this is what's going to go. What's, what's going to happen. And you just notice the flash is able to see them too. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the Flash is like, wait, who's that? <laughs> and he just pulls him out of that dimension and just drops him right in front of a Superman. I thought that was so cool. I was like, yeah, the Flash would probably be able to see him too because he's constantly bouncing between the Speed Force and our world. So he has an, He's also one of those heroes that can have multi dimensional view, you know. <laughs> and then McKay is like, yeah, I'm just some dude from Earth, man. Like just to tell you. The world's gonna end, man. Just the time is here. And Superman's like, all right, take him home, man. Just get him a soda and go lay him down. He doesn't really take him seriously. You know what I mean? And I just think that part is cool because another cool thing about the Flash in his story is that he never stops running. He just runs around his town all day, every day, twenty four hours a day. Like kind of like the Hulk in anger. What? Yeah, he's just he never stops. So so crime doesn't happen. The second someone pulls a gun to try to do a robbery, the gun's gone. And the guy's in jail. Like the second someone jaywalks, they're just on the other side of the street. <laughs> like, everyone's going. Everyone in this town is so on edge because the Flash is just running around at top speeds all day. And anytime something wrong happens, even a little bit, the Flash is on it. And he takes care of it. Yeah, it's the whole city is like in a red. They, they can they call it like a like a red uh, fog. It's throughout the entire city. <laughs> it's just it's just the Flash. It's like. Like yeah, I'm if, surprised they didn't go the route of like you how do you know live what, like that, man. Did Bad Boys come out or uh before or after this? I the comic after. Book Bad Boys. Okay. I think after. Yeah, so they could have done the whole thing of like Flash ran into somebody. Yeah, it, it just exploded, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh just exploded somebody like in the boys. Um Yeah, and then we find out kind of like why Shazam is under the influence of Vex Luthor is that they've been putting little Mister Mind worms in his head in his head yeah. the entire time and kind of brainwa slowly brainwashing him the whole time and the Shazam just kind of loses his mind <laughs> he just kind of goes ultra crazy you know what I mean as what would happen as what would happen as are as are yeah. the theme of things. But so, then, uh, as soon as they activate Shazam, isn't that is that before or after the uh, the twist? Which twist are you talking about? The one where Bruce Wayne goes, "Psych, I'm not with you guys." Yeah, that's um, during that exact same okay, time. Right. So, okay. the, so Bruce Wayne says, "Psych, I'm not with you guys," and he starts a coup amongst the villains and tries to break them up. And then Shazam kind of snaps out of it. Our Billy Batson kind of snaps snaps out of yeah. it. And realize that he's been being brainwashed this whole time. And just screams Shazam and just breaks out. And they're like, oh shit. Now we got a wild Shazam floating around. Uh-huh. You right away. Me? No, right I thought away. I thought Lex Luthor activated him. And then he went to fight, you know, Superman. Well, the thing with um, Shazam is that he's always been activated. Like, oh. Because his Billy Batson form. He never left his Billy Batson form after it's like some tragic event. Oh, where Billy right. Batson that's almost right. got killed. Yes. So he just stayed Shazam this entire time. Yeah. Which makes him technically immortal. You know what I mean? He just never yeah. ages. He just, he's just that Shazam form. I forgot he, about that. Yeah. He doesn't become Billy Batson until the very end of the story again for like a split second. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Which is kind of nutty. Um, but yeah, at this point, um, Superman goes back because, you know, the, the war is about to start, like, right now. Like, the actual... Whoa! Whoa! What is it good for? And then what, Superman and Wonder Woman have their falling out. And it's like, yo, we gotta, like... We gotta we gotta kill stuff, man. We gotta, <laughs> just in case things don't go our way. And Superman's like, no, we can't do it that way. And then Superman has his... He goes back to Batman and has a super speech with Bruce. It kind of tells him, like, you know... It's the end of the world, man. 
you, yeah. you need to shape up or ship out. You know, we can't, we I honestly can't do this without you, <laughs> you know? And uh, Superman is like, all right, forget it. Because Bruce is still giving him a hard time. So this is where Billy Batson goes to the gulag and just breaks it open. Like, like cracks it wide open <laughs> for no reason. Just apropos. Release the hounds. Release the hounds of war. So all of these really pissed off superheroes mm-hmm. and villains pop out and just like, all right, we got to go round them up. So Superman comes back, but he's, inter- but he's, he's, uh, intercepted by Billy Batson, uh, the, um, Captain Marvel in this final battle. Not you know we can do spoilers because you know yeah, this, yeah, this book yeah. is a thousand years old but this doesn't go the way you think it would go you know, right it's like it doesn't have a happy ending in a weird way right it doesn't have the, the superhero type ending that's one thing I love about this book and I know we don't want to do a blow by blow and technically we didn't we're still kind of we're doing right. broad strokes of the story uh-huh. but, but um yeah there's a there's a, a side mission of the UN planning to bomb. The, just the just to nuke the entire site, um, which is actually all, all going on while we have the super civil war before civil war moments between Superman and Captain Marvel and all these heroes and villains fighting each other. And Superman just can't beat this in his prime Captain Marvel. You know what I mean? Because that's one of the right. things about Captain Marvel is that he doesn't age. He doesn't slow down. He's powered by stupid, unbreakable magic. And Superman has aged, you know. Right. And, and it's just like he just can't beat him at this at this point. And of course you get shots of Superman in his cool suit. Um Batman in his cool suit rather. And um Superman is finally able to snap Captain Marvel out of it for a split second. And he kind uh-huh. of gives him the ultimatum like, Look, you're back to Billy Batson. You have a choice. You can either like stand down and let me save the earth and sacrifice myself. Or we could just keep fighting like idiots and just let the world end because <laughs> there's no other options. But Billy yeah. Batson makes a second choice. Yeah. Where here he does become Captain Marvel one last time, intercepts the nuke, and sacrifices himself so everybody else could live. And that's kind of the how this all ends. And everybody in that blast radius just dies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> except Superman because he can't be injured. Superman, kind of- Wonder Woman... Uh, and and Batman survive. I thought the Green Lantern, Green Lantern died too. I think did he okay. die? Yeah, a lot of them didn't make it out. Right. right. There's this cool graveyard a scene. Screen wipe. Screen wipe. The... the snap pretty much yeah. happens, and then Superman is so pissed he goes to the the UN. It's just going to destroy the Earth that way because it was if it wasn't for them and their stupid nuke, they probably could have solved this issue a lot better. But Norman kind of talks him down. For making a horrible decision, and Superman just kind of stops that and realizes that oh, Green 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 Lantern survives. Yeah, Hal Jordan survives. So yeah, they all just kind of stand down, and then the healing starts. You know, they they start bringing the Justice League reassembles. They start bringing the world back together. Some of those, even some of those um, non-lethal here, new New Age heroes stick around. You know what I mean? They they see the light of day. And the story ends with them reconvening at this. One thing about the story it has this gaudy planet Hollywood kind of restaurant, right? This has, is this is also an extra, right? Yeah, this is this gaudy, okay. pla- you know, where yeah, where they kind of have a conversation, like, hey, yeah, man, how are you guys doing? Oh yeah, no, me and me and uh, Wonder Woman are expecting in a couple of months. Like, what are you gonna name them? You know, things like that, right? And Batman's like, oh yeah, you know, I built a shelter in Gotham. You know, I'm trying to. I'm trying to have a positive influence, not just a negative. And he doesn't wear the, he wasn't, doesn't wear the black Batman suit. He just, it's all white now, you know? So it yeah. means as you know, it's trying to be more lighter and it just, and this story ends on an upbeat note of, yeah, we had a crappy past, but uh, we have a brighter future. Now, if you ask me, I preferred the one scene that they added in the middle of the story. I don't really think they needed the planet Hollywood ending, but uh <laughs> Yeah, it was a good, good run. Good run, man. He so survived. What, he survived, dude. Uh, I just wanted to take a second to talk about the artwork yes. of this book. It's is, it's it's just one of the most beautiful comic books I've ever read in my life. Can you name another comic book that has this style? 
that has this kind of artwork. Yeah. Well, Alex Gaucho Roth, or whatever it's called. Yeah, this Gaucho kind of painty artwork. Gaucho marks. <laughs> Gaucho marks. <laughs> Not many artists use this style. Um, uh-huh. like, um, maybe um. Paulo Rivera, he does a lot of Spider-Man work. He uses a lot of this yeah. art style, but not as photorealistic. Like a, isn't it? Wouldn't people call this the Norman Rockwell or whatever? Yeah, you know, um, Alex Ross is known as the Ro- Norman Rockwell of comics. Oh, he, <laughs> okay. yeah. Funny enough, you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Alex Ross is known for ha- for doing pretty much all he ever does is like covers, right? Because it's so yeah. detailed. He would only ever do covers and just kind of like one off, like like side covers for Superman, Batman. He's done some Marvel stuff too, including Marvels, which would be another good read for us, but he never does interiors. He never does a whole book. And this is one of the few books he's ever done where he just did that style the entire way. And it's like, it's a cover on every panel. You know what I mean? It's so detailed and, 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 and lit well and, just beautiful throughout the entire way. He's, he's one of those artists that inspired me when I was a young artist to be like, you can get as detailed or as simple as you want. Cause he, he, bl- he blends that line of simplicity and detail mm-hmm. and you can get any panel from this book and it's just artwork. It's just beautiful. You know um, how this art works and not nonetheless the story from Mark Wade. Like I said, this is one of my favorite graphic novels of all time. Just cause like you said, you're, you're coming into this, as a baby to the DC, DC universe, like just yeah, the, the, the yeah, I mean, you know, Superman, you know, Batman, the big names. Yeah, but, I know Super Bat and know Man Super Man Bat and Wonder Cat. Um, <laughs> Wonder. But you don't know the detailed history, and you don't really need to for this story. Well, yeah, you don't need to, but it's what what may what makes a movie or a, a piece of art like this last a long time is the people can find new more and more stuff connected to it yeah so there's like stuff that i'm missing that of like bruce wayne's son or robin's son there's a connection there at the end yep. where they're in the infirmary or yep. something like that mm-hmm. that i totally missed until like i read more about it uh so yeah um yep. they're there's stuff for the beginner, for the novice, and for the expert. Absolutely. And this is, like you said, the reason this book just kind of stands the test of time is because there's layers to it. There's so much going on <laughs> when this is going time on. If, time. The time. If you just wanted to look, if you wanted to look at one character, like, oh, what, they, what are they about? There's a whole history of, yes. of, of reach. Like, dead, if, if, oh, that skeleton dude was cool. I just want to read about Dead Man. You could just read about Dead Man for 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 months, right. you know, all his books and all his history. Um, and I think Norm, I think Norman was a good, you know, point of view character to kind of walk us through this love letter to right. DC Comics. You know what I mean? Past, present, future. Um, if you had to rate this comic on a score of five gul- of a score from zero gulags to five gulags, how many gulags would you give it? I would give it, I give it a four mm-hmm. because a uh, Watchmen is still a five in my book. That's hard uh, to beat, man. Yeah, and I like. I would. I would give it a four point five because here I like the I like the ideas that the comic book is tackling. Um, I I feel I'm becoming more and more the type of person that if superhero if the people recommend me superhero comics and they aren't tackling like heavy issues like this. I tend not to read them. Mm-hmm. I would prefer to read tale tales of suspense or tales from the crypt or suspenseful stories, stuff, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd give it a 4.5. I'm just curious. I just thought of a question. Were yeah. you surprised by the subject matter of this book? I was just bit. like, <laughs> yeah. you just like, Oh, like what do you do? What do you expect in something like this? Right. But I was a little surprised just because um, it. I I didn't know what I was getting myself into, yeah. sort of thing, and the different routes that it was taking. It doesn't. I don't think it ever get. I mean, it it lands. It's hard to determine on the barometer where it stands, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. In, in my mind. Uh, I like what what is there's so many mess what is the main message what is the main across? message yeah. of this book and that's kind of where that five points comes from me as well which yeah. I would give it a four point five 
because you can't tell me anything about the artwork. It's just immaculate. It's, it's yeah. Alex Ross had his peak, but uh-huh. the story in itself, it's like I was like I was stumbling to to tell you a a, a quick synopsis of this book because it's hard to get a through line for what it's trying mm. to tell you. But it's like that. Th- I mean, that alone, we I I can't like say it the best because there's like works of literature that are like hard to understand mm-hmm. but they're still like good but yeah the, I, I think it it this is like it there's still possibly some superhero tropes that they still cling to mm-hmm. and that's why some i could get confused in some parts uh yeah. all in all it's a it's a good attempt and all, and it's also the epilogue that they the uh, deleted scenes added did not really help the story. It feels like it just made it more kind of like <laughs> let me throw some other ideas going on about like commercialism and all this stuff. Yeah, it's because at first, like now that we're talking about it, it, makes me think if I had to say this book was about one thing, it's the confirmation of faith. You know what I mean? It's the confirmation That's, of yeah of finding your faith through adversity and through pain and through loss. Where Norman oh, had to yeah. find his faith, Superman had to reevaluate his faith. Right. Batman only had to reevaluate. Only after nuke gets thrown. Out. <laughs> only after like super nukes have landed and yeah. killed multiple things. Yeah, that these heroes had to refine their resolve and their faith in their message. You know, the faith in message, right? Uh, Norman was having a hard time finding the faith in his message, mm-hmm. where the world is going out of control. You know what I mean? Superman had to refine the faith in his message from a from a planet that shunned him for the new hotness. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, I think it's just a reaffirmation of faith in the future and faith in mankind on both sides of a meta God like Superman and in an, in an aging uh, man of faith like Norman. So right. I, I would also give this book a 4.5 uh, just because it's damn near perfect to me. But I do think the story could be a little tighter. Or, well, know? I would go it could be longer myself. Mm. Like uh, if If they did like... Instead of how like I can't remember how many issues they did or uh, how many chapters they did, but if they did it longer, like I don't want to go preacher size. <laughs> you want this to be like an omnibus, huh? You know what? this yeah. this story could have had a there's a lot in the middle of this story that could be fleshed out. <laughs> yeah, like instead of yeah. like they keep trying to go like I read on Wikipedia that they've done like prequels and sequels or whatnot. Yeah, it's a ton of Kingdom Come in yeah, the Kingdom but, Come universe, you know. But it's not Alex Ross didn't write it or Max Wade didn't do the they ditched the artwork or something like that. It's not the same. No, man. like if they did did it all like it may, I would take even a V for Vendetta like just like that. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I I would I would have enjoyed more cuz you could you really need to flesh out these ideas, I think. Absolutely. You that many. It's very condensed. There's no watering down of any of the thoughts or ideas of this book, and that could be its biggest right. problem. Is that like they? Oh well, yeah. That's the bigger like uh, the Riddler. Like I, the reason the reason why I ta- asked about like that would be so interesting to explore why there was the tension of bringing him to the group. Yeah, because he's trouble. Uh, right. And, he, and like Catwoman, he plays both sides. <laughs> right. Know? But you don't know that if you're not a avid DC comics right. reader, <laughs> yeah. you know? And that's where that kind of gets lost. It's kind of, like, I was watching a, uh, a YouTube earlier and they were talking about, I don't feel anything for the person who makes Avengers Endgame their first Marvel movie. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. like you're you're insane, right? So yeah. reading a book like Kingdom Come, with with no additional knowledge of of the universe can leave you a bit stranded especially with certain approaches to certain characters you know what i mean and it's just like oh that seems weird why would superman act that way <laughs> and i was like well because of death of superman issue 94 you know silly stuff like that right yeah man uh you ready to get into some casting Let's do it. I'm, I believe I'm ready. Yeah, man. So part of our MLT and reads is that whatever graphic novel we read, we do a fun little fan cast where we we um, cast the main, I would say, um, characters of our graphic novel and with actors who we think would best fit the role. And we also assign a director, a director who we think's vision would best um, stay true to the source material like of Zach this Stuck. book. Like Zack Snyder. Like M. Night Shyamalan. Uh-huh. So 
normally with this, I would go, I would go hero for hero and we'll just do like our, and then we'll just kind of do our stragglers at the end. So you ready to cast some heroes, my good man? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, let's start with Superman. Uh, who would you, who did you cast to be your Superman in your kingdom come, uh, DC, DC movies, uh, picture, dude. So, um, I think, so a lot of these people, a lot of the, a lot of the connections I think I have are paying homage to, uh, other things that mm-hmm. uh, are connected to comic books. Yeah. So, um, who's the, now I can't remember the name. Kevin something. He does the voice of Batman. Kevin Conroy? Uh, yeah, Conroy. Yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. Um I would he's old he's old and grisly enough that I think he could play a good Superman. Mm, um, interesting. If not uh the guy from Seinfeld that shouts out, "We're the devils!" Oh yeah, 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 putty, dude. Uh, yeah. uh what's his face? Uh he played the Tick as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I have them for a different role. So oh, okay, uh, like you said, uh, these are all old. These are all aging actors, right? Yes. There's only a couple of actually quote unquote young people in this story because they're all older. So Superman was one of the toughest ones for me to cast. Yeah. But like you, I wanted to pay homage to other things. So my cast for Superman is a weird casting, but I think it would fit. Is Kevin Costner. <laughs> I cast him Kevin Costner is a good pick. I cast him as Superman because A, he has ties to the Superman universe. He's playing Pa Kent. Uh, B, he's still a strapping older gentleman. He has a jaw. Yeah. He can be stoic. He's got a jaw. That's great. It's super, you, Superman needs a jaw. Uh, and uh, he's just super stoic. And he can really play this beaten, downtrodden Superman yeah. in this super future. So I think you put some muscle on Kevin Con- uh, Kevin Costner. You get you get his old self in the in the gym a little bit. I think he'll be a good fit. That's a good that's a good one. Yeah, man. Uh, um, what's, who, who's the next character you would want to cast? Uh, well, we can. I think we should do Batman. Let's do Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, who do you who do you got for your Batman, my good man? Uh, I would have Michael Ke- Keaton come back. Interesting. I was super tempted to make Michael Keaton come back. Yeah, I was super tempted. But it I was makes like, not sense, as... but yeah. like it would be like again connecting to the Batman movie, all this other stuff. So I think that would be a good role. I picked a weird Batman, dude. I was really trying to think outside the box. So my Batman is going to be Daniel Day Lewis, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He's okay. My now I don't feel bad about my Superman pick. <laughs> Not at all, man. My Batman is Daniel Day Lewis, the the infinite actor, the guy who can do anything. Yeah, he already has gray hair. He already has the gray black. The most stoic actor on the earth. He's gonna drink your milkshake. Yeah, the guy, the guy who can act and do anything. The last of the Mohicans. Throw that mechanical crap on him. He's he's Bruce Wayne, dude. And he'll act his ass off. He will give you a role. <laughs> so my Batman's going to be a old, a old Daniel Day Lewis, Doug. All right. Uh, let's do Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Uh, I was going to go Catherine Zeta Jones. Interesting. Foreign kind of. She can have an accent. Have an accent because Wonder Woman does have like a Themyscaran accent. That's right. cool. I dig it. I dig it. Um, my Wonder Woman. I chose Sigourney Weaver as my okay. Wonder Woman because okay. she's. Tall, she's stoic. Wonder Woman, she she's you know has pedigree as an action star. You know what I mean? Right, right. I think she can really fill out that role as the older as an older Wonder Woman. You know, I think she would be kind of cool. Plus, I have a thing for Sigourney Weaver, so I try to f- mm-hmm. fit her into all all daily conversations. Hmm. <laughs> you know, who do you have for Norman? For Norman, so I first wanted to go Steve Weber. Hmm. Do you know who Steve was? Okay. Yeah. Everyone knows. Okay. But then I was watching a YouTube video this morning, and now I want Tim Blake Nelson as Norman. Ah. Um, he also played um, the leader in the Incredible Hulk films, and it's currently on Watchmen. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Oh Brother Where Art Thou. I like him. He's a good character actor, that yeah. guy. He would fit the role well. He was also in Minority Report as Gideon. He was Gideon. <laughs> Somebody has their IBD up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just watch 30 minutes of him talking about iconic roles. <laughs> oh, bad, bad, bad. I love it. I love it. I This, bo- this book needs some color. <laughs> so 
So I mixed it up a little bit for my Normans. Oh, no. You're going to so, be that dark after? <laughs> yeah, this book needs some color. And this is really one of the only characters that I can that I can race swap. And I chose um, Jeffrey Wright to be my Norman McKay. Um, he He's in Westworld. He's going to be um, yeah. He's going to be Jim Gordon in um, in the new Batman movie. Um, African American actor, older gentleman. He can That's really fit. Pick. He can really pick. fit that role as like the pastor who's lost his faith. Amazing actor. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, yeah. let me let me spice things up a little bit. Mm. So I would definitely yeah. gen- race swap him. Can you do uh, his voice? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> he he does that. Like, he goes. Mm. Mm. I don't know if I'm a man or a robot. I don't know if I'm a man. A robot. You get too old for the. <laughs> I was gonna, you know, Spidey. I was gonna choose Danny Glover for that role. <laughs> of course, because <laughs> who's the Danny Glover's out of outside of Morgan Freeman, who wouldn't be a good fit for this? No, uh, he's a good old black man. The old black, the old Blickman. Yeah. Did you cast Magog? Magog, I would. So I have to be a younger person. Yep. Uh, for some reason, Ryan Gosling comes to my mind. Okay. Okay. But you're now making me super cautious about having only white actors and actresses. So nah, just I only have that one, that one dude. But yeah. Oh well, now I don't feel too bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're fine. But maybe have Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, cocky. Um, yeah. But it's funny you say that because I cast uh, Chris Hemsworth as uh-huh. my gog, tall, kind of cocky. I could see him just being overly gaudy. Kind of in your right. face, kind of superhero. You know, the kid from Holes. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Do it. Um, Who would you cast as Spectre? Spectre. Well, no, no. This, this. Now I remember. I because I had in my mind the guy from Stargate. <laughs> Which guy from Stargate? The the black one that went for God of War. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, the the mocap actor for God for Kratos, right? Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I can super see. He's that. got the voice. You're not gonna like my choice for Spectre because I chose Jim Carrey. <laughs> no, shut up. Yeah, Jim Carrey, dude. Shut. Jim Carrey. Why? Because one, Jim Carrey is a skinny skeleton looking dude. Yeah. B, he's a great method actor. And a dramatic actor now these days, I mean, and the guy's haunted. <laughs> he looks like he'll be a nice haunted stoic. The, this is the problem. Character. As soon as you yeah. get him on set, you're gonna go, okay, Jim Carrey, this is your time. Uh, Jim Carrey's been dead months ago, years, years now. Only the Spectre lives. <laughs> <I'm> like, what? <laughs> Only the Spectre no, no, lives. I, now. I already have Jim Carrey reprising his role as Joker, <laughs> not no. Joker, uh, the Riddler. Oh, that that's just, I didn't even I didn't even uh do do the Riddler so no I only have there. Jim Carrey specifically for that oh, <laughs> I did I I didn't go that deep but yeah I wanted something weird and I wanted something like is that Jim Carrey <laughs> you know under the hood yeah. you know what I mean give him like a cool booming voice I think it would work who'd you have for uh Green Lantern though I I chose I was just kind of free ball free I was just kind of mm-hmm. free. Free base, not free basing. Uh-huh. Mike's on drugs. He said uh, it. He said it. He said it. <laughs> clean cut. Clean cut. I picked Gerard Butler as Green Lantern. Why not? He's not. He doesn't have any speaking roles really. Just let him look cool in the back. He'll be fine. Give him some grays on the side of his waves. Call it a nice day. Yeah, I think I was going Patrick Warburton for that. If uh, Patrick Warburton was your Superman, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah. Uh, who'd you have for the Joker? Did you cast the Joker? No, I didn't have anybody cast for the Joker. I just cast I, the Joker. I could go Joe Montana. Or uh, uh, <laughs> Joe Piscopo. Yeah. I, I just I, ch- I chose Willem Dafoe for the Joker because I always wanted him to be the Joker. And even <laughs> if it is a cameo. It's only like 10 seconds. I don't care. Even if it's a cameo, I want him as my Joker, dude. Yeah. I don't care. What if the cameo have Jack Nicholson do it? Dude, I don't think Jack Nicholson can act anymore. You don't need him to say anything. He just looks just, there. Just paint him up and just prop him up. Can we get the old man to stop shaking? That's <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> Pardon my French. 
Who did you have for? I didn't hear what you said. I didn't hear what you said. Clear, uh, clear voices, clear voices. Uh, who'd you do for Shazam, Captain Marvel? <laughs> no, I'm second guessing what I say. Uh, Captain Marvel. Uh, that's a tough one. That was a tough one, but I think I found a good one for me. Yeah, but. because they they have like an important role to play in the film. Yeah. Like uh, I want to, but it, he and he needs to be able to pop on screen. Yep. So, like I would go like a Michael Fassbender. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. See, I was dying thinking, his hair, yeah. dye his hair, that infinite smile. You know yeah. what I mean? That's the thing that was getting me was the constant smiles. Like who has a creepy ass smile? And then I remember watching Dexter a couple of weeks ago. I was like, Michael C. Hall would be an awesome Shazam. Yeah, that's a good one. Just a creepy, constant smile. And he's a he's kind of a big guy, you know what I mean? Just dye his hair. And he could be that awesome kind of dark mirror to Superman. <laughs> How about this? You, he, can, he can be Captain Marvel, and then for Lex Luthor, we have Michael Fassbender. That's fine, because what's funny is my Lex Luthor is Ben Keasley. Yeah, but he's not going to do it. <laughs> if Ben Kingsley can do the love guru, he'll do this. <laughs> well, he's not going to do this because he already done the love guru. <laughs> oh, damn it. We should have caught him earlier, man. Yeah. Who'd you get for Aquaman? <laughs> no one. <laughs> All right. Real quick. For me, my Aquaman was Jeff Bridges. I would it. Jeff Bridges? Yeah, give him the beard. Let him be a, a country Aquaman. <laughs> country. country. You don't Aquaman. come around these waters. You don't come around these waters. Um, anybody else you want to just kind of lay out that you cast that we didn't mention? Uh, I think that the oh dead man, uh, make him top make his voice Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> what are you doing yeah, here? Seth Mc, you know, or, <laughs> what are you doing here? Yeah, uh, Seth MacFarlane or uh, Lewis Black. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah, I I have Jude Law be my Flash just because I thought it would be cool to see him in something. <laughs> That was about it. <laughs> Julianne Moore. The as... Worst casting director ever. Why did you pick Jude Law? He's asking like fifty million dollars. Oh, we just want to see him. In yeah, we just want to see him. I miss him. Yeah. Give him whatever he wants. We All like right. making movies. We like making movies. Uh, who did you choose director, as your yeah. Di- director? Yeah, who do you want to direct all this? Uh, I think it would have to be someone big. Like I, I just in the video I was watching this morning, the, it showed clips of a movie I haven't seen in a while called The Thin Red Line by. I believe the director is Tammy Malik. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Malik, whatever, Tammy. I think that would be a good director. Or mm. I would go... A like Steven a sum of Spielberg. all fears kind of thing, huh? Yeah. Or yeah. Steven Spielberg would be a good one because it's, he. you need a director that's able to pump up the grand scale of this yeah. without losing like uh, the, definition. Without definition, without losing character development. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. That's why with my director, I went Clint Eastwood. I went Clint. Clint. Clint would be a good director for all these old folks. Yeah. And just there weren't really... any racial slurs in it until Ooh. he came in. Yeah. Well, Batman's got to get it off his chest. Um, yeah. I think Clint would just really be able to touch on like a like the grant like the quietness of Norman, but also right. have other people kind of come in and help him with the action. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do like a Sin City where it's like, yeah, uh, Robert Rodriguez is directing, but but Quentin Tarantino directed this scene, and <laughs> you know, like J.J. <laughs> Abrams directed that scene. So I think Clint will be able to just kind of tie it together and and really, I want this to be like No Country for Old Men, but for superheroes. You know, that's kind of like where my Kingdom Come movie would come from, like these damn young kids and their explosions. You know, we got to settle them down. Oh man, this has been fun. This has been really fun. Been wanting to talk about this book for a long time. The artwork, the the story, the meaning behind it, the heroes, how this book has kind of uh influenced the generation. Yeah. Without this book there would be no civil war. You know what I'm saying? Without this book How dare you I'm just saying this this predates all that stuff, man. Um and for good reason, because it's one of those Shame. graphic yeah. novels I would still recommend for someone to go out and buy a physical copy at your local comic book store. There's nothing better than just having it on your shelf and be able to pull it down off your shelf and read it anytime you want. And plus, support, supporting your local comic book stores 
is vital to keeping the scene alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause, cause um, they're, they're doing the Lord's work, keeping this antiquated form of media alive for us to be able to see and just hand to someone and check this out. So I definitely just want to take a second to thank all of our independent comic book stores, especially Jeffrey's comics, yo, Gardena, California, um, only you can prevent forest fires. Okay. Don't, unless you're buying like a really bad comic book, don't set your stuff on fire. Uh, did you have any passing comic book thoughts before we close this bad boy out? Yeah, like if you have any more recommendations, uh, send it our way or send it to me on Trash Monk, the third Trash Monk, I, 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 that's Trash Monk. I, I, I. Yeah. You can also and send, yeah. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, dear. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, also send your recommendations to at M Nerdiverse on Twitter. That is at M Nerdiverse. Let you know what you think of this uh, review. And if you have anything that you want us to check out, any graphic novels or uh, collected um, tomes that you would like us to read and review and cast, please let us know. As of now, I've, of course, been your host, Mike G. And I've been your host, Trash Monk Third. And we will always ask you to support your local comic book store. Support them now. Just say no to drugs. And just say no to drugs, unless mm-hmm. it's some kind of super serum drug. Mm-hmm. Then take Keep it. it. Yeah, support your local comic book store. Keep it, it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, superhero. 